Today's episode of The Jai Dave Show is brought to you by the new Simrad album, When We Return, now available on all digital platforms, Spotify, Apple Music, wherever you get your music. A magnificent album. I can't recommend it enough. You're going to hear about it in today's episode. When We Return, Simrit, S-I-M-R-I-T. The new album's called When We Return, wherever you get your music. Today's episode of the Jai Dave Show is also brought to you by the Life Force Academy. If you have a mind, you have a mission. Ultimate home kundalini yoga experience. Go to lfa.yoga uh, to start a $1, 14-day trial. Life Force Academy, lfa.yoga. Hey everyone, Jai Dave here. I know I say that like pretty much every episode, this is an amazing one. This one I think is my favorite episode we've done so far. Uh, it's definitely the most emotional and powerful episode I think we've done so far. Uh, it's very close to my heart because it is with Simrit, as many of you know is my wife. And she is also uh, my very favorite musician, singer, and so many other people's favorite musician, singer. And you're going to hear uh, so much in this. We start off talking about her new album, When We Return, the touring experience, her band, their creative process. We listen to some of the music. And then at a certain point, it goes into Simrit's uh, life story, which is an amazing story, and you have to hear it. It's so inspiring, emotional, powerful. Uh, Simrit was adopted. She was born in Athens, Greece, and then adopted at a year and a half, and she lived as an orphan in Greece for a period of time before then, and adopted to an amazing Greek family who lived in the USA and South Carolina. I'm grateful for that because I met Simrit. I also grew up in South Carolina. We met in Charleston, South Carolina when we were both in college. And, uh, but this is a, a very, very beautiful story. And, um, and I, I just think you're gonna love it. And we're also joined by Bethany Crouch, who you'll hear from. And she's uh, part of the Simrit music team now and also part of the Life Force Academy team. And she has a background in a reporter and news and media and she's an amazing person she's a powerhouse in and of herself and you're gonna enjoy hearing it was really important I thought that she was part of the conversation because she just brought especially you know Simrit and I we we're married we live with each other and she brought a freshness to the conversation and uh, I learned a lot and I you know, teared up a couple of times during the conversation I know Simrit did I know Bethany probably did too and uh, you probably will too, actually, if you listen to it. And, and you're going to hear some great music. And it's, it's, it's deep, it's heavy, it's light, it's beautiful. And uh, again, I think this might be the, the best episode yet of our podcast. I'm super happy for you to hear it. This is one I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share with every important person in my life. I'm going to send them this and, um, and ask them to listen to it. And especially those who know Simrit. And um, so anyhow, really grateful that this is coming out and uh, that you all get to hear it. Uh, thanks for being a part of the podcast. If you haven't subscribed yet, please do so. Leave us a rating. And uh, thanks for listening to everyone. Hey, everyone. So here we are in our living room for this episode in our home and Simrit and I are here and then also our special guest Bethany Crouch who's recently joined the Simrit team and also the Life Force Academy team and uh, she has uh, I'm glad you're here obviously you have a great um, well we love you oh I love you guys and <laughs> you have a important background in media and just tell everyone what is recently your your work has been in the world doing what? Yeah, for the last twenty years, I've been anchoring, producing, reporting for uh, different uh, network affiliates: NBC, ABC, CBS, 
Um, been all over the place. Yeah. Fox. Wait, no. Was there ABC? No. <laughs> 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 Most of them. <laughs> So I thought it would be great uh, having Bethany here also is to you know go into Simrit's story a little bit. We have the spring tour coming up, which we're all really excited about, and it's going to be east coast of North America. Uh, the new album is out. It's incredible. It went to number one on the world iTunes charts. So wi- good. Within so 24 good. hours of being released. and um, and I, But still, I think, you know, there's so, so many more people that – will and need to hear this album it's it, it's one it's a first of all it's a type of music you can't explain it to anyone because it doesn't have a genre yet really <laughs> yeah. we do our best to kind of define it for practical purposes but it's it's groundbreaking type of music and then furthermore i in my opinion it is the best simrit album yet and i i love all of them And I and each one progressively has gotten better, and I think that's also rare in the arc of an artist. Mm-hmm. You know, you don't always hear that. And this is when we return uh, from beginning to end uh, is superb and just masterpiece. So anyhow, <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. What if we started just listening to the opening, not the whole song, but the opening number to when we return opening number that sounds like something like my grandfather would say the opening number <laughs> I, like <that. laughs> i like it too it's uh, elegant classy. yeah classy yeah. the opening number to uh, uh, when we return it's just simply called ccv and we'll let it speak for itself so we'll just listen to a couple minutes of this and here we go
it's hard to turn this one off. Yeah. Uh, what is this so song like for you now that it's out? Where did it, where did it come from? Like, how did this song get created? Do you remember the creative process? I do. I was um, I was sitting in our guest room, and I had just found out that our friend had cancer, mm. and um, and I remember we had been like texting or something and she had told us over I mean I know we had all talked and stuff too but we were texting and um and I told her I was gonna write a song for her or like write a song that was inspired by her or my it had to do with her I was gonna write a song for her that's what I told her I was like you know and it wasn't necessarily a song that had like her name in it or anything but the energy of the the mood really inspired me and I started writing it um, with that kind of in mind and then it kind of took a life of its own and kind of grew legs of its own and um, I started really digging in the um, I started digging in the chords more and more and I was less thinking about her and the disease um, that she was experiencing, but I was thinking about uh, more about, I, I was just more trying to climb the mountain of the chord progression of the song and figuring that out after that. So it, that kind of distracted me from the heaviness of the feeling of her and the disease she was experiencing. So yeah. you're, you're writing though in, is it pronounced Gurumaki? Yes, and yes. What is that? Um, well, um, this is a uh, very ancient language, thousands of years old, really, but it, it really came through um, a little over 500 years ago from the northwestern tip of India. And um, this beautiful sage um, named Nanak, um, I th it was around that time and a little bit after he was around, but uh, I really resonate with his poetry, um, but some of the sages that were uh, in a in the lineage of Nanak that came out of that um, that era of India in that area of India um, used to um, used to give this language to. Uh, promote a sense of peace and empowerment and well-being in the mind and happiness. And this language really is a derivative of the Sanskrit language that is thousands of years old, one of the oldest, considered one of the oldest languages on the planet. And in that time in India, in, the, in that area uh, close to Pakistan, um, Sanskrit was only reserved for the high caste and even only a few of the high caste were able to experience Sanskrit. Uh, so most of the lay people didn't have access to such a language that now we scientifically know um, that sound and language can go in and transform the you know, neurotransmission fluid of the brain and the blood chemistry and all this kind of stuff. Um, now science is is talking about that, and now people are actually being able to accept that that that's a real thing. Um, but before it was seen more as esoteric. It was um, before science started to explain it. At least in our time, it was seen more as esoteric. Um, but when the language was given, um, it there was a sage that came after Nanak that gave the language because um, he noticed that the people um, around him were suffering and he wanted to give them something practical and really powerful to help them uplift themselves, uplift their societies, give them a form of personal identity and things like this and personal empowerment. And, um, and so he created, there was a language that was created for the lay people that was is similar and derivative of Sanskrit called Gurmukhi. And this language is considered 
uh, scientific language that goes into a person's being and can transform their consciousness in an instant and transform the way that they perceive life and it actually can alter their perceptions of reality. So physical health, mental health, emotional health, spiritual health, all that kind of stuff. Wow. So that's kind of like a long shot without giving like all the details and telling like a 30 minute story. Uh, that's nice context. And that's yeah. the, so when folks are hearing the mantras in some of Simrit's music and, yeah. and, and in different yogic traditions, that's a little bit of insight into it, you know, cause people will hear it and, you know, it sounds obviously it's foreign. And, yeah, totally. and what are they saying? And I always think of like mantric languages and it's not just Sanskrit, Gurumukhi, but most of the, all the ancient languages, yeah. Hebrew, yes. they're mantric languages. And so like what they mean is more determined by what the sound does. Yes. So like mm-hmm. that CCV stands for Chatur Chakravarti. Mm-hmm. And that's a mantra that invokes courage in a human being oh, and, wow. and, and it's for radiance but what I like about Simrit's whole, you know, project and how they, she, and they uh, just go about things is they're not throwing that in anyone's faces because it's just like you don't need to know really, honestly. I mean, you can. It's great. You can learn that. But just to be in the vibe of it, you know, it's not proselytizing it to anyone. It's just like it's just beautiful. And also there's such a how would you describe like the rhythm, like the way that that language moves the tongue and the mouth and like the rhythm of it, it has a certain just pure beauty to it. Yeah. So f- the way that I like to, for me, explain the, the way that the languaging works inside of the human vessel, basically like it, it is a map. It's a guide map to, um, it's a guide map to lead the tongue to specific places, to the roof of the mouth. So each sound, um, w- which is contained in a word, um, and each, um, yeah, each, basically each, each sound um, within a word tells you where to place the tongue in the roof of the mouth. So it's a guiding, it's like a guiding map system. And it tells you how to place the tongue what it should sound like, where to roll the tongue, where to, you know, go retroflex, where it's like putting the tongue back in the roof of the mouth, um, where to make aspirated sounds like a, with like a breath, like a breathiness, like a, or a, um, yeah, things like that. Um, and it is basically a roadmap to guiding your tongue, where to hit the meridian points on the roof of your mouth we have 84 of those at the roof of our mouth and um, when we do this in a specific um, sequence in combination which the words give us or the phrases give us or even once one of the sounds can give us then a specific result is created and so and that can be invoking certain feelings of you know victory of fearlessness uh, radiance. Um, but the cool thing is, is that all of the mantric language that we use does that. All of it take, brings you to that same place within yourself. But, um, but each specific word and sound kind of is like a fast track to that specific, I would say to the, to the specific, um, um, mood or feeling or. Well, which would yeah. make sense why you would choose, you know, that how it would be inspired from your friend who probably really could have like courage is something that was a a, a huge gift for her during this time period totally. and so that that would make sense that it that is makes where sense, it came but i wasn't from. thinking about it like no, that it was, it was just organic. wild it was so organic and then i was like beautiful oh like later on after the song was created i was like whoa yeah like one thing about the mantric language that i think is really important for me to understand and has been important for me to understand over the years. And I heard someone that has a very deep relationship with mantras say this before, and I really have a lot of respect for her. Um, she doesn't use the mantras in this particular um, tradition in the Gurmukhi language, but she uses Sanskrit mantras. And I remember hearing her say something that I always felt 
inside myself about it because I was never concerned about what the words meant necessarily. I was more, um, I was more into the feeling of it. Yeah. How do I feel when I'm using this language or when I'm articulating this language, when I'm articulating right. these sounds, like what kind of feelings am I get? you know, what kind of a trance am I going in? I'm, I, I like this trance that I'm going into. I'm, I'm really like, I really like, how am I getting lifted? How am I going deep? How am I going to this trance? Like that kind of stuff really is like important to me and really like is attractive to me. So for me, I never was really concerned about the meanings of the words. And sometimes, although I think that sometimes um, the me knowing the meanings of the words can be a helpful doorway into a feeling of something, but I think that sometimes um, people can easily get caught up on the meanings of things because I don't think that we have any kind of accurate uh, definitions of what these words and sounds really are. I think we have translations that kind of lead towards that those mm. kind of me but i don't think we'll ever sufficiently be able to really articulate the meanings of these words and these sounds and when people tr try to define them i think it kind of limits what the 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 full spectrum of the energy mm -hmm. actually is of each of the words or sounds or phrases or whatever yeah, sometimes it does because these are conceptual languages. So, so sometimes there's just simply not an English translation right. that does justice to it. So, I feel the same way. That's sometimes why I'm often hesitate yeah. when teaching when people ask what a mantra means. Oh, well, here's what it, you know. Here's a sense of it. You know. Well, I like the description of it's more of a a sense of of what it's what's happening in your body mm -hmm. when you're yes. experiencing it, and clearly. I mean, I've been at your concerts live. I've been at the immersion live. So I know what the experience is like in my body and then having a huge room of people who are also experiencing it. It is transcendent for the people who are in the audience, but it's also clearly transcendent for you. Yeah, definitely. I personally, when I'm, when I'm using this kind of language in the music or when I'm singing in this language or whatever, I don't ever think about the meanings of the words. And I don't personally know the meanings of every single one of the words of all of the songs necessarily, or all of the, um, or all of every single sound in the phrase or, or in the word. I don't know what each of them mean and nor am I concerned with that. I know sometimes I'll know basically what the phrase means or I'll, I can break down each word, but it doesn't like it, it like, you know, it's like, it doesn't make sense to me after I'm like singing it or, um, putting it to music because it's so much bigger than the words to me that I just, when I'm singing it or something, that's why I'm able to go into that space yeah, of that yeah. trance because I'm not really thinking about the meaning of it. I'm just allowing the, my body in conjunction with the words or in the, the, these incredible sounds, these universal sounds and these primal and mystical sounds to do the work right, basically. It's, it's a technology. It's a language. It's a technology. It's a technology yeah, that's sure. creating a vibration yes. that's within you and surrounding you. Yes, totally. And so everyone there in your yes. presence and your band, everyone's experiencing it. It's just like totally. radiating. Yeah. And I, you know, I love, I love to sing and, you know, I've always felt this way. I felt I had this same kind of experience when I was a kid singing in the Greek Orthodox choir I had these same feelings where I'd close my eyes and I would just go so deep and so far out, like into space, you know, and mm. people would notice that in the, in the, um, you know, in the, uh, church, in the church, <laughs> <laughs> but it's, uh, in the congregation Congregation. in the congregation, that's the word I was thinking of, mm -hmm. trying to think of at least, um, they would notice it and they would also say they would feel such deep feelings when I would be singing. If, if there was a time where, um, yeah, uh, you know, sometimes I, I just get taken by the music, and I think that's the main thing is I just get taken by it and the sounds and the feelings of it that um, nothing else really matters at that point. Like I could, you know, that I've I've had such amazing experiences in the music like that where I've been like, wow, if 
I were to go like right now, this would be an uh-huh. amazing time for that to happen. Mm-hmm. Like, wow. you know what I mean? Like this is cause it's, You're at you a know, peak. <laughs> yeah, it's so ecstatic and, and it's so beautiful, it's such a beautiful feeling. And I You're feel held. so You're happy to share that. that. Yeah. Yeah. I feel happy to share that. Uh, well, on that people. note, you know, I recently, a friend of ours who I was close with Ram Das and Ram Das had just passed away. And uh, he was, I was talking to him and he had just started, we had sent him the CD actually of When We Return. Uh. And one thing he mentioned, they said, it's, it's really great death music. <gasps> and um, and I know what he means by that. Really, all Simmert's music is. But at the same time, and this is just to kind of to expand that out further, you know, we had at, at the Los Angeles concert uh, and the fall tour, uh, our friend Emily, some of you may know uh, of Emily, Sex with Emily. She has a podcast um, that's very, very popular. She has a uh, very popular show on Sirius XM, and uh, she's a doctor of sexuality. And so her whole world, you know, revolves around sexuality and, and seeing that and, and really helping people and through that through that dharma. Incredible. What a gift she's giving people. And her comment was, this is the best music to have sex to. <laughs> yeah. So I vibe with that too, though. Exactly. And that's, it's like that's everything. my point. Yeah. Because it's, it's the it, best music to dance to. Yeah. <laughs> it's the best music to have sex to. I mean, it's the best music to lift you out of a funk. Yeah. I mean, to clean the house to. To be sad to. Yeah. To be happy to. Yeah. It doesn't have, that's what I love about this is like, just like it really, we don't really have a way to call it a genre. Yeah. It's it, everything. It also <laughs> doesn't have one particular mood, and I think that speaks to an energetic quality in the music. Yeah, that transcendent thing. So let's let's hear just a little bit of another song that's not in Gurmukhi, uh, <laughs> but is you know purely Simrit and uh, is the jam, one of the jams, <laughs> the, the jam, jam <laughs> on when we return. Um, this one's called Just a Glance. Thank you. 
Love song. It, what is it? <laughs> yeah, it, is it a love song? Is it sure? It's a love song. <laughs> I mean, it, it, was this for your husband? <laughs> is it a love song about me? Of course, <laughs> no, of course, it's, it's a love. It can be a love song. I think that <laughs> it's not. First of all, let's establish <laughs> that that was a joke, and it is not a love song about me. <laughs> okay, well, I'm and happy for the clarification because I've always assumed like, no, is this a, a well, song about Jai Dave? <laughs> so this is this isn't this a collaboration? Yes. No. Um, so Salif. Bamakora, who's uh, my band, long, long-standing bandmate, long-time bandmate, and, and dear friend, who just did that solo that we were just, just played that solo. He plays in our band. He's he's been a long-time band member. He plays the 21-string West African harp instrument called the kora, but it's hardly a harp. It's it sounds like a cross between like a harp, an acoustic piano. guitar, piano. <laughs> It's, it's, it's a rhythm spectacular. Yeah. You, have just, you have to just see it. It's and he plays so with wild. four fingers. He plays with his two pointer fingers and his two thumbs, all 21 strings. And he gets into mm. it. He's so into it. Most of the he's time he's got his eyes closed during the whole mm. concert. He's so into it. And so you guys collaborated on that? We collaborated on this song. We've collaborated on a handful of songs so far, and I look forward to collaborating on more songs with him. Um, but yeah, he brought this incredible melody uh, that he's playing on the Chora. And um, and we built the song around that and like the beat and and the vocals, the vocal melody and all that kind of stuff and what Shannon and Jared are playing. And, and yeah, it's 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 always a real treat when Salif brings something to the table. For what sure. what did inspire the lyrics? Um, a, a beautiful it's, uh, Salif was reading some Sufi poetry, mm. and mm. he he brought this Sufi poem to the table. And of course, we read the poem together. I literally brought it to this living room table and we <laughs> sat down, the two of us, and we read this poem. We were like, wow, this is so beautiful, but it's so long. And obviously, we're not going to put this poem word for word in the song. We're not going to put the whole thing in there. Um, so we uh, wrote the words that were inspired by this mystical Sufi poetry in there. And yes, it's about love and devotion, and it can be, you know, with your partner, with yourself, with your loved ones of all kinds. Yeah, so, um, and then, uh, but now that you play this part, um, this part came in, uh, Jai Dave was t actually teaching a yoga workshop in New Mexico, and me and my whole band were there, and we were playing Just a Glance in the workshop. And then all of a sudden we started doing this slow jam like this. Mm. And it, this song came out of that workshop. <laughs> I don't know if you remember in that and There's so many tent. great musical moments that have come out of the, the so many. yoga workshops. Yeah, well, we really we just, love that. Because yeah. if we have like say a two hour workshop, we they might do two songs the whole time and just riff yeah. and jam, jam. And, yeah, and, and make, go deep. And yeah. create new songs mm -hmm. out of this one song that we're playing like three new ideas like for songs come out of that and so this came out of um 
jamming on just a glance for his one of his workshops for like an hour and then we went into this and we were all like ah oh, this is amazing you know and we all like you know brought different pieces to the table and you know with this band the Simrit band every single one of us has such a we bring something so powerful to the table and there's such an undeniable chemistry that happens when we play and when we get together and I just feel so grateful to be in a band where everyone really gets along and respects each other and where we have this incredible musical chemistry in such a way that like if we have like a disagreement about something or if we haven't seen each other you know in like months or whatever and then we start playing together from like the first moment we start playing we all get giddy because it feels so good oh, that's that. when you know and it's like electric feeling you know it like it's gets magic. under your skin that's when you know that you can't that's chemistry that you can't plan that's called organic chemistry that happens by the the, the universe you know the grace of the universe it's like you know and being open to that and just being like you know just so fortunate to be able to be in an experience like that because much band, cooler you know. organic chemistry than we had <laughs> yeah, in school. Yeah, totally. I was just thinking about that. <laughs> organic chemistry was tough as shit. It, it'd be good to just for a moment mention everyone like Shannon Hayden, the just virtuosic cellist. Oh, she's yes. phenomenal. And she plays largely the electric cello in your yes. band, but on some of the albums also. Oh, yeah. She, she, she can plays a vintage acoustic any cello. cello. <laughs> she plays a vintage acoustic cello. She owns one from the 1800s that she Ooh. plays, and she runs it through the, the acoustic and the electric cello. She Similarly, she runs through this massive spaceship of a pedal board yeah. <laughs> with tons of effects that just like... Yeah, she's she's incredible. She's such a soul sister. It's cool to and watch her. Yes, like, so cool to watch her. Audience, she's so beautiful she's just, and she's such a badass and she's so um, she's so creative and she's so like like I I resonate with her um, choice and her selection of sounds and her choice of, of yeah, like this chords. part right yeah. here, just all of y'all riffing together. Yeah, right yeah, here. like this wasn't planned. We we're like, you play this part, you play this part. This is just like that's her organic. Yeah, that's her. Yeah, she's super soulful and um, just I, I love being in a band together with her and being friends with her. But uh, honestly, like. Like we just like go on a magic carpet ride together. Mm. She and I could sit together in a room and we're like flying, you know. And then you take also, everyone else with you. Thank you. Yeah. We appreciate that. Yeah. You're welcome. <laughs> we journey with you. Jared May, extraordinary bass player. Yeah, Jared really, May. Everybody in this band is heavyweight. Soulful. Heavyweights. Yes. Heavyweight, super soulful. Um, everyone has this like uh, electric connection in the music together. And yeah, so like, yeah, Jared super super heavy bass player uh love love his choices I, I love his feel uh he's got incredible tone and, and and just like he just grooves so hard too on the stage and he can what i love about jared is he could play so deep and it's he just has that strong feel that just gets under your skin you know yeah mm. i love that i love that bass is really important to me oh yeah and i think with everyone in the band um i could speak for everyone in the band that bass is super important in music and um the quality of the bass and jared really brings that really really amazingly so and he's just yeah. got a joyful spirit when you see yeah, him you're like he's oh. so funny he's big like heart. big heart he's yeah. one of the the funny he's like i would say he wins the award for act the uh, fool act he, the, won the, uh, he wins act the, the act the fool award yeah he's like one of the funniest people in the band and um he's just yeah it's fun to hang out and and uh and it's fun to play music together because he's so joyful about it yeah yeah yeah, yeah then sure. dev and ashley on percussion yeah oh, Devin crushes dev it. <laughs> yeah he crushes it the first time we played in the studio together many years ago i was like gosh i was like god man that he's so soulful and again the feel in the pocket um that's something that's so powerful and so important to me dev can play a beat and just hit the drum like simple yeah 
And it's like everyone in the audience that goes nuts over it. They're like, <laughs> oh, my God, it's the most incredible <laughs> drum I've ever heard. Because like, he has that feel. He, it's this feel. Yeah. And it's and it's also his energy. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's the tone he gets on the drums. I mean, he's got all the technical know-how. But it's not like Dev is so n- like not in his head when he's playing. He's all about feel. He's all in his heart. He's all in his body. And um, he's, he's a type of drummer like... Is someone like 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 a really amazing drummer like Quest Love, for instance? Dev's Dev's in that you know, um, Dev's in his own Dev Dev's in his own. Uh, but you know, like he's played with he's, some pretty big bands. He's, he's played with some amazing people and um, he's, trained in the black church growing up since a little boy. Yeah, you know? trained in the gospel yeah. church mm-hmm. from the time he was real young, like grade mm-hmm. school mm-hmm. seven, I think. Mm-hmm. So you guys and, have that in yeah. common. I mean, you both got yes. started, your musical yes. careers got started yes. at church. Devin and I have that in common. We haven't talked about that much, but we do have that in common. Jared also played in the gospel church a good mm-hmm. bit um, wow. in Florida. Wow. So the, he has some of that in common too, but I don't think he started when he was really young in the gospel church. I think as he got older and was in like, you know, high school, he was doing that and older. But um, yeah, so everyone, I mean, but Dev and I do have that in common and we have a lot in common. We really get each other in a lot of ways. He's a good brother and, and yeah, it's fun to play together. Well, He's an there's another drummer. element of this, you know, that comes through, obviously, that's really, you know, your story. And I don't know how specifically it comes through. It comes through every aspect at some level, you know, Um I, I know some people know, a lot of people don't know, and, and a lot of people ask what's with the headdresses and what's with, you know, and I think understanding your story gives such a um, kind of, it, it's what gives substance to what's really going on in a lot of ways. And you were born in, in Greece. Can you tell folks about that? Yeah, I was born uh, as an orphan, basically. I was orphaned from the from the day I was born. And um, my mother was only 16 years old when she had me, and she was not allowed to keep me. Her her family um, wouldn't allow her to keep me. She wanted to, and um, she wasn't able to. We just found all this out recently, about a year and a half ago, when we went to Greece to actually meet her for the first time. Um, you know, my parents, my my parents who were also full Greek, who adopted me into the United States, into South Carolina, <laughs> out of all the places. Um, you know, they, they were very open with me and my brother, who was also adopted from another Greek family in Greece. Um, they were very open with us from the time we were like three years old, you know, from the time we could even comprehend, you know, what that would be uh, potentially. And, of course, they didn't go into great detail when we were three or anything, but they were really honest and upfront with us and, and just nonchalant about it. It was just like, yep, this is how it is. This is what it is. She couldn't take care of you because she was really young. And they were really, they were just like, it wasn't charged. It wasn't a charged thing with my parents. My parents never felt guilty. Uh, They never felt they had to overcompensate with us or anything like that. And I really appreciate that because I, I have such a healthy relationship with being adopted, with being an orphan. Um, And, uh, yeah, I was, so I was an orphan for about a year and a half and then, or maybe a little bit more and then came into the States and I had lived with a foster family, uh, not a, not like a traditional family with like a father and a mother and kids. I lived with a woman and, um, who lived out on a farm. And this was in Greece. In Greece. Yeah. So I was, uh, I had lived in, in an, uh, orphanage. For a little while and then I lived in a foster home with this woman and I was the only child there. And she was with her brothers. She had some brothers that lived there and I think would come in and out of the house. I I remember I used to um I they used to have to keep me in a playpen a lot because, you know, they just you know, and I totally understand why. Um, but I do remember that growing up because uh Oh, sweetheart. Yeah, it's, it's, it's yeah, it's wild to talk about it. It's uh, it's yeah, I had to I had to um grow up in a playpen for a little while just because they can't get close with the children that they're fostering because they got to eventually give them up, you know. Yeah. So, I think for a good year I was 
uh, just alone a lot. You know, I had to take care of myself and self soothe, and that was, um, yeah, that was um, an interesting experience because I don't remember a lot of it consciously, but I do remember one scene when I was in that home, and they were really nice people. You know, the like the brothers would come and like I would. Um, I remember I was in the living room, like as you walked in the door of the house. And I can remember um, when the guys would come home and, and all of the guys had facial hair. <laughs> so I always grew up loving facial hair from the time I was real young. Um, growing up Greek, we had godparents and my godfather had facial hair and I always loved to be around him. And I always begged my dad to grow a mustache at least, you know, always try to get him to grow a mustache and a beard. And one time he grew a mustache for me. <laughs> And then he shaved it really quickly. <laughs> After you, like a month, he you, shaved it. You got your beard. Yeah, I got my beard and mustache. <laughs> but the guys that would come into the house and uh, like her brothers would come in after work in the evening time. And I remember this kind of like this happened pretty regularly is I would be in the playpen just hanging out, you know, doing my thing. I don't know really what I was doing in there. But um, and, you know, they fed me and took care of me and made sure that I had everything I needed in that way. Um, but they, uh, I slept in the playpen. That was like where I would sleep at night. And, um, and the guys would come in and they would like pick me up and be super like jovial with me and like toss me in the air and, you know, laugh. And it was a really sweet experience actually. And I do remember that part of being in that home. That's I mean, the one part I remember. Uh, I remember being fed milk a lot. I, I was fed a lot of goat milk. Yeah, a lot of goat milk with honey back then. Um, but you were so. alone in the playpen a lot. Yeah, yeah, that was that was a big part of my upbringing the first year and, and a half. Um, I don't know how long exactly I was in the orphanage before I went to the foster home. But when I um, before I went to that foster home, I actually almost went to another foster home, or I did go... I almost got adopted by another family from Chicago. The family came and got me. Something didn't work out with them. I didn't go to Chicago with them. I stayed in Greece. Something somehow, maybe some papers didn't work out or something, but it worked out that I had to go back to the to the foster home where I was staying and um, or go back to, yeah, I had to go to back to that foster home or go to that foster home for the first time. Um, after it didn't work out with the first family. And I'm really glad it didn't work out with that first family because um, my beautiful parents who came and got me, I wouldn't have, you know, I wouldn't be with them. I wouldn't have had the experience that I had and I wouldn't be sitting here with y'all. I certainly wouldn't be, you know, uh, I, I, I would not be here right now. I would be in Greece or in Chicago. <laughs> it, would, it would have been a different life for sure. It would have been a very different life. And, um, yeah, you know, I, one thing I'm really grateful for is that I always experienced some form of love, you know, growing up, um, whether it was, um, you know, being like tossed in the air and played with as a little baby and as a toddler and, um, you know, and then moving to, to, uh, South Carolina with my family. I mean, my parents are extremely loving people and they're very affectionate with us growing up. And like I said, they, they, never overcompensated or tried to overcompensate because we were adopted. They treated us as if we had come from my mother's womb. And she has this beautiful poem. Jai Dave, you've probably seen it on the bathroom mm -hmm. wall that I'll never, ever forget. I'll always uh, keep it with me. And anytime I see an orphan or talk with someone who's adopted, uh, talk with someone who was adopted, I share this poem with them. And uh, it's this really short poem that says that my mom cross-stitched it on this uh, on this sweet little fabric and has it up in our bathroom framed. So we always saw it growing up. And it says, uh, not flesh of my flesh, nor bone of my bone, but still miraculously my own. <laughs> Never forget for one single minute, you didn't grow under my heart, but in it. <laughs> it's so sweet. Mm. So that's always been a... Whew, yeah, beautiful. Mm. I love, beautiful. I love your your like bravery and courageous spirit in sharing this story. Uh, thank you. And I think it highlights your resiliency as a human, and it also reminds all of us, like 
we're all worthy and we're all enough. And you are a testament to that. For sure. Mm. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. Yeah. I had some, I had a, had some beautiful karma or something because I had a, I came into a really beautiful family, a really beautiful, loving family. So, um, yeah, I must've done something. I don't know what I did, but <laughs> I must've done something, something, uh, right to come into a family like this, you mm -hmm. know, that loves me so much and they've supported me my whole life, you know, in every endeavor, everything I've ever been interested in and with my artistic nature, I've always been, um, you know how artists are, you know, we're so like, we're so different and we like to do our artist things and we have so many kind of different kinds of quirks and, um, and my parents have always been just so, um, just so supportive and amazing and such wonderful people. And they really taught me a lot about love and kindness and support and warmth of heart, just like the simple ways of being and the mm. most important ways of being. They taught me that really, mm. really beautifully. Mm. And just this, uh, what was it? A couple summers ago, year and a half ago, uh, everything kind of came full circle because after, uh, some years of uh, searching out yeah. and we went back to Greece and uh, Simrit met her biological mother and her mom that you know raised her of course came with us of, and uh, her biological mom doesn't speak English very well and Simrit doesn't speak fluent Greek uh, but her mom does their parent, her, well, you say your parents used to speak Greek <laughs> yeah. in the household when they didn't want the kids to know what they were saying. <laughs> yeah, they used to speak Greek around us, not with us. They used to speak Greek around us so we wouldn't understand them. Um, they sent us to Greek school, so we were at Greek school three days a week. We learned how to read and write fluently. I could read a whole freaking, um, you know, I could read a whole book in Greek for you. Could I understand everything? Not mm. really. <laughs> but her mom acted yeah. as the, her mom was a translator yeah. largely yeah. between beautiful. the biological yeah. mother, who's a beautiful woman, and the yaya, the gr biological grandmother is there as well and a beautiful woman. And yeah, um, yeah what was that like? Share what that was like. For you. I mean, it was extremely emotional. It was yeah. beautiful. It was. Yeah. And it was so amazing to have you there with me, Jai Dave, because and City Amrit, you know, our son and um, and my mom. It was it I had a I felt like I had such an, a major support system when I was there because yeah. it's um well, first I should say to give context, we met my biological mother, I met her first on um on FaceTime. That's right. On a FaceTime call. Um I met her so so for a long time you know, like my whole life, I was just really curious, you know, I had like this longing to find out, you know, it's natural, you want to find out where you come from, like who your family is, you know, I always was fascinated by just seeing and, and still to this day, meeting my birth mother did not quell the satisfaction or, or, or sorry, not quell the satisfaction, mm -hmm. quell the fascination of, of seeing how family members look alike or how brothers and sisters um, act alike or how family members have similar traits or the ways that they act or, you know, like I just always thought that was so cool growing up. Like I was always fascinated by it and I still am. Like it's like a huge fascination of mine. And I'm sure if anyone here that's listening is adopted, I'm sure you can relate, you know, because it's, um, it might seem like just like so petty or so silly or something like that. But really it was like one of the most profound things for me to experience. Like when I would go to a friend's house, I would always be like, wow, it's so cool. You and your sister like have the same kind of nose or like, oh, it's so cool how you like, you know, do this little like thing or you walk similarly or, oh, you do that. You have the same kind of, you know, thing that your mom has, like the way that you look or the same kind of energy or that was always really fascinating. So I, I think always, that would be like normally you just take that for granted. Like I wouldn't even think about that. I wouldn't even yeah. think about like looking like my parents. Like of course I look like my parents, but I of course yeah. it would be different for you. And then totally. to be there and also to learn that you come from this lineage yeah. of powerhouse female singers and performers. Yes. I mean, so you got to experience right there that that yeah. fascination in real time for you and your your own bloodline. Yeah, for sure. I mean, from the time I was young, my mom 
and dad told me that my mother was a singer in Greece and that when she was pregnant, she was still traveling around Greece singing with me in her womb. And, and my birth mother confirmed that when we went and met her. It was really cool. And, um, and I found out when I was doing the search for my birth mother, that was about a year and a half search um, to two years, something like that. And, and at least, yeah, at least. And during that search, I found out that my great grandmother was a famed singer in Greece. And I didn't know about my great grandmother. I knew about my mother, but I didn't know about my great grandmother. And at the time when we were doing the search, she was still living. And she was like a famous, uh, kind of similar to like what a Broadway actress is here that sings and dances and um, she wasn't someone that, uh, she was a singer and she would sing and in, in, she would sometimes sing separately, but her main, the, the main way she was known was through like, kind of like Broadway style shows, like theater and, and singing and dancing and stuff like that. And um, she just passed like, uh, like a year before we came to Greece or uh. something like that. It was like really kind of sad. I, I really wanted to meet her and she was... Um, I think she was like in her early nineties or something like that. So, um, so when, when we got to, well, first when I met my birth mother on Skype, that was just, I think Jai Dave even has video of it, yeah. which I haven't seen. Cause I think that would be kind of emotional it's, for me. It's an amazing <laughs> video actually, because it is, it's <laughs> extremely far more emotional than actually meeting her in Greece. Wow. Yeah, it was, yeah. it was because, because was that was the first time. meeting, like yeah. seeing her. And so, you know, like, that's a s it's like a lifetime of mystery that yeah, it just so gets revealed. crazy. Both it was like a them. lifetime of longing. It's uh, both. I mean, both of you were searching like for too. each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she was searching for me. And for she a never long had time. any other children. <gasps> She's never had any and she other was children. Heartbroken mm -hmm. to let you go. Yeah, she was heartbroken, and her and her best friend when we met them in Greece, or actually when we met them on the the FaceTime call, they were like, "God, oh, we've been celebrating your birthday for all these years," and <gasps> oh, so I was right. like, "Oh my God, like." Yes. Yeah. yeah my, it, it's like, I'm really happy. I got to meet her. And, and I'm also like, I also like feel for her because she's had a lot of grief in her life about it, Yeah, you know? And, um, I've, I've haven't had that kind of grief obviously because I didn't birth a child and let the child go, but I had a different kind of longing and curiosity and, um, yeah, like, I don't really know what the emotion is. It's, it, I, I can't, pinpoint what the name of that emotion is that I felt um or the yeah or that feeling I guess you know I didn't just I, like I there was a piece of you that was missing that you couldn't yeah like you yeah you didn't know like you didn't know what you didn't know you just knew you didn't know it yeah I knew I didn't know it, it was kind of wild <laughs> so to meet her was a real trip and I was really nervous I was I was really nervous to meet her on the Skype call or the FaceTime call or whatever. And that was a real trip. We stayed on that call for a few hours and she met Jai Dave and she met Sidi Amrit. And, but to meet her in person was really, I was really nervous too. Jai Dave can tell you, I didn't sleep uh, literally a second the night before. I, I think I kept you up all night. I <laughs> pretty much had a nervous breakdown. Uh, I, I, was... I think that that was the only time in my life I'd ever had a breakdown. Like, I don't think I've ever experienced anything like that before. Like, I was, like, not able to... I wouldn't call it a nervous breakdown. I would... Yeah, it I don't was know what it was. It, was, it, was, a, some, it was an anxiety uh, in... I, I didn't... Well, yeah. it's your emotion, but I didn't experience as, like, someone having, like, an anxiety attack or anything. It was just... To me, from an outer perspective, it seemed just so primal. Yeah. Uh, something, like, coming from deep within the subconscious. You know, like... Think about it, like just the story you told us of being, you know, a year old, year and a half old and, you know, in an orphanage and then uh, some family takes you and then brings you back and then like all this, like that's all in there somewhere. Yeah. And then also your nine months in your mother's biological mother's womb. Mm -hmm. And I just think it came from like some deep irrational place like that. There was nothing rational about what... And it wasn't just the night before. It was the whole, like, really... Oh, the surge. It would, it would it come intense. in waves. Yeah, there was, was intense. I was actually so relieved uh, <laughs> when we met them because it had been such a... It was, it was heavy, you know? It was a intense surge. The surge, it was like, it didn't feel heavy my whole life. I mean, I was always introspective about it. 
it felt mysterious. It felt like, like there was that feeling that I couldn't put a, put the finger on of what it was. I always wanted, I yearned and, you know, really like, where did I come from? Like I really wanted to know and always felt so different, you know, because I didn't really have friends that were adopted. So it was hard to relate with people. And my brother, who's amazing being, he has special needs. So he and I didn't really rap about it. We didn't talk about it growing up. So mm. I really didn't have anyone to talk about it with. Mm. Yeah. So I kept it a lot inside and I would, you know, talk with God about it. I would talk out loud about it. Like, um, you know, I did a lot of work on it myself as a child. That's amazing. Um, <laughs> well, I, ha I had to, I didn't really have a choice, you know, yeah. um, I, I was always, you know, nervous to ask my parents questions about it, but I did, you know, and when I finally mustered up the strength to do that, they were always so cool about it. It was never anything that they said or did. It was my own just kind of like. Why were you nervous? Well, I just didn't want to hurt their feelings. Yeah. You know, I didn't want them to feel uncomfortable. And, you know, I just like I felt like God, you know, like they adopted us and gave us so much love. Like the last thing I want to do is like be a brat. <laughs> the last thing I want to do is, you know, when you're a kid and you are you know you've been adopted and your parents are loving with you like the last thing you wanted, well, for me at least, the last thing I wanted to do was be a brat. Like, I just wanted to serve them a lot. Like, I wanted to take care of them when I was a kid. I wanted to help them raise my brother. Um, mm. They needed help, you know, with that. So, like, I just stepped in. Like, it was my duty and no questions asked. And, you know, because you feel like, God, like, you know, they gave me so much. Like, I could have, like, really had it tough in a certain way. And they, they... They, like, got me out of, like, a really sticky situation. It mm. could have been really sticky. You well, know? and you've and blessed their life. Oh, definitely. Well, thank they you. would tell you I the mean, same, of course. Yeah, I mean, they're mm. such kind people. I mean, they're so, they're so authentic. You know, they're, so, they're just genuinely loving and kind, like, salts of the earth people, my parents. And, um, well, you're such a blessing. Mm -hmm. Both of you and your brother such a blessing in their life. Yeah. It goes without saying, but let's say it. Yeah, yes. I think well, we, we absolutely have well, to say that. Well, when we were watching that Bobby Weir documentary yeah. on Netflix from the Bob Weir from the Grateful Dead, who we love and adore, <laughs> um, he is, uh, I didn't know this till watching that oh, documentary. Yeah. He's uh, adopted, and oh. he said something in there that just, because I, you know, my mind also wasn't tuned to adoption until, you know, my life and combined with Simrit's life and then it became a big part of my life too via Simrit. Yeah. And so, you know, then once you're tuned into something, you, you, you notice it everywhere. And when, sure. when he said that too, he said the same thing. He said every, every adopted, every person, uh, adopted person eventually want, has a natural curiosity of where they came from. And of it's course. something that I will never understand sure. at a visceral yeah. level. You know, I can only understand it through compassion, you know, and, and empathy and love, but I can't understand it via my own experience. Yeah, it's, a, it's definitely a trip. It's a, it's a trip, but I, I think it has taught me a lot of empathy um, towards other people and just their, the things that they have, because it's like a, it's just like you can't, it's not anything you can escape or act like it's not there. It's always there. It's like a thing that's always there. People that know it, like, you know, growing up, I was telling Bethany last night, we were talking about it. You know, I never liked to tell people I was adopted when I was younger. I always felt um, just uncomfortable about it. Not not about being adopted, but about sharing it with people because I didn't know anyone else that was adopted personally that was a friend or family member. I knew there were people at our church that were adopted, these two kids, and that's all, you know. So it, we did. Re my brother and I really didn't have anyone to relate to. And my brother really doesn't relate to being adopted anyways because he's got special needs he doesn't even think in that way um but yeah it was always kind of like I always was really hesitant to talk with people about it to I let can, people know in my whole understand. life yeah because I didn't want people's like pity mm -hmm. because a lot of people especially growing up in the 80s and 90s a lot of people like you know they kind of like at least what I felt is that, you know, and I kind of got this from kids at church growing up and stuff, like, you're so different when you're adopted and like, oh, she was adopted. Did you know the Bellios oh, the girls adopted, adopted the adopted girl or the adopted kids or, oh, isn't she so pretty? She's adopted or, you mm. know, like that kind of stuff. And you hear that, you know, you hear it. Oh, gosh, 
you said, you know, you hear it your whole life and it's like kind of like a, feels like a little bit of like a taboo thing. Mm. So you like said you it kind of made you feel dirty. Yeah. A little bit like awkward to talk with people about it because yeah, a little bit dirty. Not, not that I felt like dirty on my skin or <laughs> in my hair, but just like, yeah. It's, and it's hard to explain why, you know, not because I felt like I was inherently dirty or anything like that, but just, there's just a, yeah, it's just a feeling about it. And I can, yeah. I can, that makes sense to me. Yeah. Absolutely. Not because it's not, not because it's not it's like a, a depressing feeling. No. It's just like, I, I had this wisdom in my, I think because of the situation I grew up in, I guess, like I ha I just knew that if I told people, some people wouldn't understand and they would have like this, like weird kind of like pity for me. And I honestly, I didn't want that kind of energy on me, you know, exactly. It already felt, I already felt so different my whole life because I was adopted and I just, and, and being young, when you don't have anyone to relate with in that way, you just feel different, you know? So I didn't want to like have any extra energy on me projected in that way. And you know? I, that makes sense that and when you're a child and you don't know how to protect yourself against other people's yeah. energy, yeah. like maybe that's where the sense of like the dirtiness came from. Like it wasn't, it didn't have anything to do with you, but it was the energy that other people unconsciously Could've would been. be putting on you. Yeah. Cause like or they like, don't know how to, make sense of, of it in themselves because yeah, totally. it, it is something that's hard to have a touch point with if you don't have a personal experience with it. Yeah. Yeah. And I can understand, you know, and I never felt like it was like people's responsibility to understand it or even know about it. I just kind of felt like it was no one's business <laughs> growing up. And I kind of, I grew up like that and I, I didn't really tell anyone I was adopted until I got older, you know, until I was in you know, was some of my close friends and like my boyfriends in high school knew, like if I was close with them and only a few close friends knew, no one else knew. I love Ex that yeah. you're willing to talk about it now though. Oh, like, and like it brings in that ability for people to connect with you from that authentic place and from that raw place, because you know, we all have something. Yeah. We all have something that makes us different. Story. Yes, it is. It's your history. It's your roots. Well, well, that, that's a, a big, you know, we grew, uh, what I wanted to share about the headdresses, because I know you were talking about that earlier. And yeah, that's where I was going to go. That. There's, we could talk about the adoption stuff for like hours and, and it's, you know, that's, it's, you know, that's, we could do that some other time. But I know that um, people are curious about the headdresses. Oh, and for sure. Where they come from. They're powerful. They are. And, uh, you know, I uh, started researching my lineage you know my uh, my greek lineage and um always knew i was greek always grew up in a greek really thick greek culture so i was really fortunate to have grown up in such a strong culture with strong cultural values and all that kind of stuff i think that um that's a great fortune in my life to be from greece and even though i was adopted into the united states i still was around greek speaking people I was cooking Greek food. I was Greek dancing every week. I was going to Greek school. I was at the Greek church. So I was like in a very rich, steeped in a very rich culture, listening to Greek music all the time. My parents always listen to Greek music. And, um, and then, and that's uh, even just that so significant because, yeah. you know, of course they, I'm sure they also listen to like popular American music. However, having like, you know, especially when we're talking about now, like the music you're creating just, you know, the rhythm styles, the key signatures, the just the yeah. the tone of Greek music, you know, if you know the story and then you listen to her music and you know about the richness of and sophistication of Greek music, yeah. um, it's it's such a rich musical legacy that, you know, was just via osmosis, Simrit was immersed in her entire life. Yeah. You know, her parents playing great, great Greek uh, singers. And so it's not that only listening, only hearing like Whitney Houston and Barbara Streisand, right. but like oh, you're yeah. hearing, you know, these fabulous Greek singers as well. And that has, you know, and then not only, and then comes, you know, the yogic stuff later and all that. Yeah. that and then you can hear, hear the music and, oh, like, Okay, that's kind of what that at least yeah. gives you some yeah. sense of like what it is. You yeah. know? Well, and then you, yeah, you sure. weave in your, your love of the Grateful Dead and mm -hmm. Led Zeppelin. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, like yeah. You just have <laughs> such an amazing eclectic sound. And then you 
tie in your roots and we talk about like the headdresses. The headdresses. Yeah, so the headdresses. Where do they come from? Yeah, so back cool. to the headdresses. The headdresses. So cool. Because so they're the just head- <laughs> amazing. <laughs> Thank you. They're inspired by the power and beauty of the the Greek goddess and the Greek women in the times of antiquity in Greece. And to me, when I would see images of Greek goddesses with different headdresses and certain Greek gods, you know, um, with headdresses and the women from antiquity that were, um, in particular, my father taught me about a beautiful culture in which some of our relatives come from. Um, there's a culture in Crete that was over 5,000 years old now, and it's where people equate Atlantis used to be and everything. Wow. And it's the Minoan civilization of Crete. And there's a lot of things that you hear about the Minoan civilization, about like um, the Minotaur that lived underneath a palace and the king would send people down there. But what people don't know is that um, the Minoan civilization was not run by a king. Um, if there was a king there, which there is speculation, there's speculation that there may have been a king and a queen there, um, that the the main council that ran the society, which was a very egalitarian society, a very artistic society, it was a very um, economically flourishing society. It was very peaceful, and it was based around the arts. So the the society, the, and it was it was peaceful and beautiful and very, I think, eccentric, because it was based around the arts. It was a society completely based around the arts and um, trade commerce with like Egypt and the rest of Northern Africa, which explains like the total DNA thing uh, with like Greece and Africa, you know, Northern Africa, especially Persia and this, these kinds of areas. And I have all of that in my DNA. You know, there was so much trade happening and and there was so much mixing between the cultures and everything like that. Um, In the Minoan civilization, this, this council of women would be running the the society basically making the decisions for the society and they would wear these gorgeous um, dresses and headdresses and their headdresses would have like snakes and made of gold. And um, some would have like, um, you know, like not spikes, but yeah, kind of spikes coming. I mean, there's so, yeah, yeah, so many different things, wings. And of course the traditional and the typical kind of Greek headdresses that you see, um, the, the, I, I've worn a headdress like this recently on a tour is like the Greek, um, goddess Athena of wars, warrior headdress with a horse hair mohawk. Right. And, that was your and fall tour. That piece. was fall tour. Yeah. And it was just like all last year. And, and there's um, actual horse hair. And it's real horse yeah, hair. You want to tell them how that came about? Or? Yeah. Well, the, well that came about because, um, we have a friend that, had a horse farm here and I wanted to use real horse here. I wanted this headdress to be authentic. I wanted it to be the real deal. And I wanted to feel that energy and represent because when I wear these headdresses, I go into a space. It's, it's like I'm on the road and I'm in like, you know, whatever I'm wearing and everything and it, and we're just hanging out and it's great. It's awesome. It's cool. And I love that space. And then we go on stage and it's like a ceremony that happens or mm. something like a really like very ceremonial or something. And it's not like we're trying to be like, Hey, this is a ceremony, everybody. <laughs> it's not <laughs> like that, but it's so, it's got like this really cool, like grooving and mystical quality to it. And the headdress really puts me in that space. And I remember someone told me one time and then it, this woman told me like, and a lot of people have said, wow, it's like, you're like a, it's like, like a shamanic kind of, vibe like when you have that headdress and you're yeah. doing these kinds of like vocalizations and I'm like oh that's really cool because when I'm doing it I'm not thinking of it you know when I'm in the space I'm not thinking of it like that and neither is the band like the band is, we're not like we're gonna go into a shamanic <laughs> vibe or anything no it's organic yeah it's totally organic but people have said that and then I remember this one woman saying like wow when you and it stuck with me when you came out um, with a headdress and everything, like it really inspired me. And I went into, I had like a shamanic, a full on shamanic journey and I didn't take any drugs. And that's what she said. And I was like, wow, 
that's that's wild well, like that's, that's really cool that's not a rare thing for people to say to you having been to your concerts no. like, totally that yeah. o- people often say like wow i had a transcendent experience with your yes, music very like completely sober and i was journeying yeah totally and and all types of people come some people come on psychedelics some people come totally sober and i feel like they all come for their own reasons you know everyone comes for their own reasons but that's definitely something that people have told me they experienced and that's not something that we're trying to create. It's not, um, but it's, it's happening, but it's happening. And I think that, I mean, we're, are, we are intentionally, trying to create well, that, right? when I say we're not trying to create it, we're not specifically saying, I'm not saying, Hey, I'm the shaman. I'm going to come on stage right. and do this thing. Right. And you know, Salif's not going, I'm a shaman up on the stage. Doing but your this intent thing. is to enter into another space, right? Our intent is to, to, to enter into this galactic portal that we always <laughs> enter, you know? So, yes, yes, up, yes, it yes. is very much <laughs> accurate. Yeah, because because it's phenomenal. It is fun. It is adventurous. It and is it, beautiful. It is ecstatic. And it's phenomenal, this space. Why? Like, where else would we want to go? We would we want to go into this, yes. you know, amazing space, Amen, you know, sister. this galactic space. And we want to go with you. <laughs> Thank you for taking us. I want to play uh, the closing number awesome. from when we return. We heard like the opener. We heard a uh, just a glance from kind of the middle of the album. This album, by the way, I probably already mentioned it two or three times. It's a beginning to end album. It's, you know, it's so, so often now you don't get that kind of album because in the, you know, play, play, excuse me, streaming era, playlist era, singles, you know? Oh, right, right. This is an album that you push play at the very beginning of the album and you let it go to the very end. And you have an experience much like a concert. (laughs) (laughs) Truly, it is transcendent in that way. Um, I'm excited for a new live album coming out not too far in the distant future. Uh, oh, yeah. But for this, this is called Kana, and I believe it's, at least to a certain extent, inspired by the mm-hmm. blossoming of your connectivity during that whole adoptions, or not adoption process, but the search, for, yeah. uh, you know, really what I experienced, Simmer's always been you know, very proud of her heritage, but this mm-hmm. was this deeper kind of blossoming that seemed to take place during that whole time period that we've been, you know, that she told the story to us about. And so I think this song Kana is one thing that came out of it a little bit. Can I play it? I'll play just a little bit of it. Simmered album when we return 
Oh my gosh, I'm so excited to go on tour with you. Can I just tell you? <laughs> we're so excited to have you on the tour. Can we just tell you? We're We've been telling you that now. This, Bethany and I are so oh. stoked. Bethany and I have so much in common. It's amazing. It's it's awesome. It's amazing. We, I, <laughs> when does the tour start? Um, right around April twenty second. Yeah, yeah. About April twenty second. Yeah. At the time we're recording this, the dates are still being firmed right. up. But by the time yeah. you're hearing this, they'll probably have been released. Yeah. yeah. Oh man, it's gonna <laughs> yeah. be so good. But this is the East Coast tour, uh, so it's through April and May, uh, wrapping up at LIB Memorial oh, yeah. Day weekend, and that oh, is yeah. gonna be ridiculous. I mean, that festival is so cool down in Southern California. Oh, yeah. That's That's lightning in a bottle. Yes. Yeah. yeah, it's gonna be fun. We're going to play a couple shows and play in Jai Dave's class, too, and one, at least one of his classes. Mm -hmm. I think so it'll be super fun. Yeah. Um, well, I want the whole world to hear this album Me and too. even more so to get to the concerts. And I'm really excited to see how this everything develops over uh, the coming years because this is, um, you know, I, to I tell people all the time, I think it's something that's like we've never really heard before. It's its own thing, and anyhow, thanks for sharing all this story with us. I know that was, you know, very vulnerable, and you know, it's but it's such a beautiful story. And, and it's inspiring, and your vulnerability is inspiring. Oh, thank you. I mean, truly. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having me on the show. <laughs> okay, well, I, I, I feel like I feel like I I really have to do my tour manager thing here and right. just remind everyone that in the fall we'll be in Europe and then we'll yes. be back on the West Coast. <laughs> yeah. So there are going to be so many opportunities to get to have the Simrit experience and it is an experience live in concert and I just, oh man, it, it, it is transcendent. And what you bring is a gift Thank and you. what you bring as a whole with your band, it is, it's truly transformative. Thank you. It um it feels amazing. It feels amazing to be able to do it. I feel really fortunate to be able to do it in the first place. And I feel so fortunate that that people come to the shows, you know, and love the shows and that people love and the music do. and they like do. it always blows us away every time. Like, you know what I mean? Cuz you're like, humble, that's why. It's just like, wow. It's it's um yeah, I feel, I feel really fortunate to be able to do it and yeah, thanks for sharing about the music and the, and the journey on here. Well, I think this will be one of many podcasts that we're doing. And uh, obviously, I mean, we're around together all the time. And, <laughs> and who, my most favorite person to talk to. Aww. Yeah. Thanks. Aww. All right. Well, everyone should come out to the concerts. Tell all your friends. This is, um, you know, yeah, I don't know. I don't. I can't say more about it because it, every time I try to talk about like what it is, it, it tends to feel like it comes up a little short. Mm -hmm. So just, you know, do yourself a favor and, and make it out to a Simmert show. She's in your area. Um, get the new album. It is written. Get all the other albums that while you're at it, all on Spotify, Apple Music, wherever you get your albums. And there'll be a limited vinyl release of the new album coming out. I'm excited for that. The new album, that. When We Return. When We oh, Return. Yeah, what yeah, did yeah. I say? <laughs> I said it is written. Yeah. That's because oh, the song I'm about to play. Yeah. I was looking at yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that was almost the album name. That's almost. True, right? But we decided on When We Return. Mm. And um, uh, I'm going to say something real quick about yeah, the headdresses. Say what because I, oh, I yeah, know yeah. we did. I just wanted to mention because people are like, why do you wear them? So, mm. so I wear them just to say it like concrete. You know, I wear them because I feel inspired by my roots. And when I wear them, I feel that I'm representing my roots. And it's uh, such a it feels so good to wear them and it feels empowering. And I literally feel my lineage coming through me when I wear those things. Yes. Like it feels like a, like I'm like representing and carrying my lineage with me basically. Does that make sense? Yes. It makes 100% sense. And I think that yeah. comes through and, and I'm not just talking about like my blood lineage. I'm talking about like, not not my immediate blood lineage, but I'm talking about like my lineage of female, powerful Greek women. Yes. You know, that have represented for years before I was around and that I've, you know, have the responsibility, but also great fortune to carry them with me. So it feels really amazing. Representing the goddess, bringing yes. the goddess forward. It feels really beautiful. Well, I notice, you know, 
particularly women in the audience afterwards when you talk to them are so inspired because you here's this other powerful woman yes. up on the stage just like in full force you know and a lot of people simmer tells me people often comment i've heard people comment oh i didn't realize how small you are because because <laughs> yeah. the sound is so big and the energy field is so big yeah and, and the then, headdresses can the be so big the, which by the way you help create yeah like, that's an important yeah. point we didn't these say these are pieces oh, yeah, of yeah. artwork yes, that you have a hand in yeah for sure like I, I i have the visions of what i would like to wear and um, i work with a beautiful local artist here julie ellen and you know we're gonna put a piece out with her in it eventually because um, yeah, yeah I just, she's I want incredible. people to see the behind the yeah, scenes of what she's it goes incredible into creating it. She helps to actualize the vision, and you know, we'll we'll come and edit some things and ask. I mean, we might add some things to it or subtract, or but she's an amazing person to work with. And I've worked with other artists before as well. I've worn a couple of headdresses from different artists around the country as well, but um, the majority of the headdresses that I wear are created here in our hometown of Nevada City uh, with a local artist, a beautiful, she's a metal worker out of all, like of all things. And she just was like up for the job. Like she'd never done these kinds of headdresses before. Love it. Again, much like the music we create as a band, like in these workshops that we were talking about, this is how she works on these headdresses. It's just like, yeah, it blows me away. She's amazing and she's super humble and it's always amazing to work with her. So yeah, it's yeah. fun because- yeah, it's like an art project too, and like I get, like it's not just something like I'm buying from a counter no, no. and putting on my head. It's like wow, we're actually like making these things, You're you know, creating them. And yeah, they <laughs> should be like museum pieces after. You know? I, no, I seriously, I have a vision. Yeah. I want them all to come on tour with us, yeah, right? <laughs> so people can experience them in person. But I really quickly, you also have a way for people to learn more about their own voices and empowering their own sound through the Life Force Academy. Yeah, there. Um, yes, Supreme I, Sound. I have yep. a course out called the Supreme Sound, and I have got another course that we just released um, just recently called um, Clear and Confident, and that's for. Um, I was inspired. Um, to do it for women it's for anybody that relates with the female energy it's for anybody that's not a female it could be for men it could be for whatever you um, whatever you identify with however you identify um, yourself um, it could be for anybody but I'm specifically speaking to women um, about women and how to really truly empower ourselves as women no matter what the backstory is and how it's our responsibility to really take take charge of our lives and and there's some beautiful tools and we use kundalini yoga in there there's some powerful kundalini yoga uh, meditations in there that really help to you know create those changes actualize yeah. those those changes and yeah. hearing your story it really ties it in as to why yeah. that would be really impactful yes. for people <laughs> yes True. yeah it's yes. all empowering yeah totally all right, we're going to close with one last piece from the new album, When We Return, and this is the song. It is written another collab with Salif. Yes. Salif Lyrics inspired by the great master Nanak, yes. who we, Simrat mentioned yes. earlier, who the, the Sikh Dharma was born through his life, and um, this is one of his kind of epic, from one of his epic mantric poems. Yeah. And they took a very, um, some of the translations you get from these old, you know, texts get a little bit of like uh, they're colonialized in yeah. the sense you know because even not you know northern india was occupied by the british for so long and so sometimes you'll read these translations of the mantras and it sounds like we're reading like you know the king james version of the bible <laughs> and um <laughs> so funny. and uh so there is a, a beautiful woman ekon Kar, mm -hmm. who has a really uh just a, a really lovely translation mm -hmm. of Nanak's, um, Nanak's uh, poetry. poetry. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so I know this was inspired, this inspired by that. By that. Yeah. And uh, it's called It Is Written. And uh, so we'll close out with this one. Okay.
Thanks, everyone, so much for listening to the podcast today. Uh, if you haven't already subscribed to The Jai Dave Show, please subscribe. If you like what you're hearing, please leave us a rating. We'd love that. And thanks to Simrit. Thanks to Bethany for being a part of this one. Thank you to the Life Force Academy, the presenting sponsor of the podcast. Please go over to lfa.yoga to check out the Life Force Academy. And we got lots of great stuff coming up on the Jai Dave show in the coming weeks. Thanks for being a part of it all. If you haven't already, head over to Spotify right now or wherever you get your music. Type in S I M R I T. Look for When We Return. Check out the amazing album art. Download that thing. Get this music. Stream it. Share it with your friends. Talk to everybody real soon.